our passage this week is Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Uh, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So this passage comes at the end of our sermon series called The One, where we've been following Jesus as he preaches through northern Israel, from small town to small town, encountering various groups of people. He's preached to scribes and Pharisees, the sick, the demon-possessed, and skeptics. And so he traveled from town to town in uh, northern Israel, and in this passage, he's in a town we don't know by name on the Sea of Galilee. He's preaching to this room full of people, maybe a house full of people, and it's so crowded that no one can get in. It's standing room only. The people in this room are probably a little bit of everyone we've encountered so far. Probably some Pharisees who had heard his teaching and were interested and had followed along. Maybe some sick whom he had healed in a previous town. Maybe people who had heard from a source, from another source, from another source, that there was this teacher going around but they're all interested, wanting to hear him speak, and this room is full. In our passage today, we have another group of people wanting to encounter Jesus, wanting to see, is he the one? Is he the Messiah who was to come? This time, the group is his family. And they get to the house, and they can't, can't get in the door. So they speak to the person at the door and say, we're, we're Jesus' mother and brothers. We want to speak to Jesus. So that guy forwards it to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. And it finally comes to Jesus, the news that his mother and brothers are, are outside and wanting to speak to him. At this point, Jesus uses it as a teaching moment. He asks, who are my mother and my brothers? In verse 48, we read, he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? So in order to understand what Jesus means by this, we need to understand what he means by mother and brothers. The meaning of this passage hinges on what Jesus means by family. In other parts of the gospel, Jesus says things like, I'm the bread of life. He's not talking about him being a loaf of bread. In that instance, he's taking the characteristic of bread, the nourishing, the life-givingness of bread, and attributing it to himself. Elsewhere, he says, I'm the gate, or I'm the door in some translations. He's not saying he's made of wood. He's taking the characteristic of a door and showing that he is the only way to heaven. So is Jesus doing that in this passage? What does he mean by family? And I think there are a couple of ways that we can read this that'll get us off the right track. I think the first one is that Jesus is not making a genealogical statement. He's not denying that Mary gave him birth. He's not denying that uh, these brothers are blood relatives. That's not what he's doing at all. And that may seem obvious, but I think we can also show it from the text. If we look at verse 40, 
No, sorry, verse, verse 50. Jesus states, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He's making this offer to, to whoever. That could be multiple people. And in that sense of someone giving you birth, you can't have multiple mothers. So we shouldn't read the text that way. I think another reason is that the genealogy of Jesus meant so much to the early church. That him being the son of Mary, the son of a virgin, that meant a lot to say about his divinity. So for those reasons, we should not believe that Jesus is making a genealogical statement. Another way I think we can misread the text is to see it as Jesus abandoning his family. That they come to him wanting to speak and he's rejecting them and saying, no, my disciples are my family. I think we can see this very clearly if we skip forward in the story. After Jesus has been arrested and tried, tortured and mocked, and hung. He's on the cross and he sees his mother. If we look at John 19, 25 through 27, let me read this. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. If Jesus, at his dying hour, in unbelievable pain and agony, spends some of his last words to make sure that Mary is taken care of, we shouldn't see this passage as Jesus abandoning her. He's not rejecting his family. So what does he mean by family? What does he mean by my brothers and my mother? I think Jesus is addressing an assumption so if we look at verse 46 through 47, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. In this scenario, there's an entire house full of people who want to speak to Jesus. Why would you bring forward another person who wants to speak to Jesus unless there was an expectation, some underlying assumption that he would honor them more, that he would step outside and talk to them? This isn't just a, a plain statement, I want to speak to you. It's, I want to speak to you, and could you come outside and talk to me? In fact, we do this all the time in our daily lives. I'll be talking to my wife, Melinda, and I'll say, oh, you know that restaurant that we love, that uh, Vietnamese one on, uh, on Michigan? We haven't been there in a long time. What I'm also saying is not just we haven't been there in a long time. I'm saying we haven't been there in a long time, and I'd like to go there soon. Um, other times, my wife has said to me, um, Dan, when was the last time you showered? <laughs> and she's not just interested in when the last time I showered was. She's making a statement that I stink. So what we have here is uh, the crowd bringing forward this assumption. Your parents, are, or your mother and your brothers are outside wanting to speak to you, and they expect that he'll go out and talk to them. 
I think this is what Jesus is replying to when he, he means family. That there's this assumption about what a family is, and he wants to use that assumption to relate a spiritual reality about the heavenly family. At this point, Jesus shifts the focus from his identity as son of Mary to his identity as son of God. The crowd had thought, because he's Mary's son, he'll honor them. He'll step out. They can rely on him to talk to him. It's someone who you can rely on. It's someone who will be there for you in family. And he takes that assumption, and he wants them to rely on him as the son of God, not as their genealogical son. And what's great is he makes that offer to more than just his mother and brothers. He says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So that, that offer is to us as well. That he's offering us to find our dependence in him, that he be the one that we rely on, that we go to when we need help. So if he's making this huge offer that we find ourselves relying on him and satisfied in him, I think we ought to ask ourselves a couple of questions. One, are you in the family? Does this apply to you? If Jesus wants to satisfy your needs, if he wants you to come to him in reliance, are you in that family? Have you accepted that relationship with him? How do I know if I'm in the family? Well, we see in verse 50, he says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So do you do the will of the Father? What is the will of the Father? How do I know if I'm in the family? Well, in verse 49 and 50, we have some parallelism. He says, pointing to his disciples, he, Jesus, said, here are my mother and brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That for statement is connecting those two statements. It's explaining the first one by the second one. And we can see parallelism between them. Jesus is pointing to his disciples, says, You are my family, for whoever does the will of my Father is my family. So what is the will of the Father being Jesus' disciple? Elsewhere in John 6.29 Someone asked Jesus, well, what is the work of God? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, to be a disciple of Jesus. So this is not just going to church. This is not checking Christian on a census or, or any sort of checkbox like that. This is following Jesus. This is soaking in his teaching, loving it, internalizing it, and letting it change you. Now, some of you, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe this is your first time in a church, and you don't know what does being a Christian look like. You may have conceptions from what you've seen in media, or what culture is pushed as being a Christian. But I think we need to take it from Jesus himself, since he set it up, what it means to be a Christian. So if you have questions about what does it look like to give my life to Christ, what does it mean to be a disciple, 
After the service, I'll be up here on stage and will gladly help answer any of those questions. I think the other question, other than are you in the family, that we need to be thinking about is who are you depending on? You know, you may be in the family, but you're still not going to Christ on who you're relying on. So Mary and Jesus' brothers came to him, and they were expecting him to meet their needs because he was their son, because he was their brother. And Jesus quickly wants to shift it and say, you should rely on me as the son of God. Now, you and I aren't going to be in that same situation. My son, what, when I have him, I hope, um, will not be Jesus. Your ch child is not Jesus. We're not in this exact same situation. But we can still put those sorts of expectations on our family. Jesus wanted us to see him as the one that we could fully rely on. And in fact, there's something really sad if we expect to be fulfilled by some specific person. Now imagine that there's some need in, in your heart that you, you really have, and we feel it. We need other people. And if you believe that could only be fulfilled in your mother or your father, or it could only be fulfilled by, by having a baby, or by getting married, what are you saying to the world? What are you saying to the orphan? Or to the person who wants to get married but never does? What are you saying to Uh, it's, it's just hard. You're telling them there is a need in you that will never be satisfied. When we look to have those needs fulfilled in another specific person, and Jesus is saying, I want you to have them fulfilled in me. And there's something really beautiful about that because it's universal. That Jesus is the one that you can rely on, that you can rely on, that I can rely on. And he's offering that to us. Now there's a real tension that I feel in this passage. Because we ought to find our reliance on God that we ought to seek him to have our needs met. And yet, very often God meets our needs through other people. So how do I know if I'm relying on another person to meet my needs, or whether I'm relying on God to meet my needs, and it could be through this person, it could be through my family. So step into a hypothetical with me for a moment. Consider a time when you desperately needed help. Maybe you had a long day at work and you were very stressed and you just needed someone to talk to and unwind. Maybe you were lonely. Maybe you needed money, and you couldn't feed yourself or your family. Maybe you were depressed, and you're having all of these awful thoughts in your head, and you just need someone to talk to, someone to get it out and, and vent to, and they'll be patient with you and listen. I think we've all been in this scenario something like that, where we needed someone. At that moment, was there a specific person 
that you expected to help? Or could it have been a variety of people? Did it need to be this person to meet my need? Or could God have met my need through a variety of people? And when that specific person let you down, when they weren't available or weren't as patient as you needed, did you get upset? Were you frustrated? Were you angry? Why can't you be there for me? I think that's a great sign that we're trusting in someone and not in God to meet our needs. Now think about it. If I come home from a hard day of work and I'm stressed and I'm fried and I just want to want to talk to Melinda. And she has some, something on her schedule. She already has a prior conflict. If my hope is in specifically in her to meet my need, I'm going to be upset. Because my hope is crushed. I expected her to do something that was not her responsibility. However, if I'm trusting in Christ at that moment, and she has some scheduling conflict. I'm not devastated. Because I believe that he can fulfill me in another means. So why I think trusting in Christ is very important is because it's so relaxing <laughs> that we're not putting these pressures on our closest relationships to meet a need that God himself wants to satisfy. And that should be a huge relief on your family, on spouses, And it, it would ultimately bring us closer together, let alone closer to God. To wrap up my message, I'd like to say we can trust Christ. So Jesus is making this big statement, come to me as the one you can rely on. I want to be that for you. And it takes a leap of faith to trust him. But I think we can. Because in our biggest need, he was there for us. That every one of us has fallen short, that we've sinned, that we're deceitful and proud and we try and twist situations and only give information to make ourselves look better. And we do that all the time. That our biggest need is that we have sin in our lives and that separates us from God. And he was there for us when we needed him. That Jesus Christ, being God, all-powerful, emptied himself of that power in order to demonstrate his love on the cross. That he took a punishment that we deserve so that we could be with him in eternity. Now, if he did that for us, how much more can we trust him to meet all of our other smaller needs? Let me pray.